Well, take your Bibles tonight, if you will, please, and turn to the book of Luke, the book of Luke tonight, Luke chapter 19. We took a little extra time this morning in the morning service, and so I think we'll, uh, I don't think we'll keep you very long tonight. Very, very simple message tonight, but uh, wonderful truth. And so Luke chapter 19 in your Bibles, and when you find your place, let's all stand tonight, if you're able, that is, let's all stand tonight out of respect for the reading of the Word of God. And why don't we do some responsive reading tonight? And so I'll read the first verse, and then you read the next verse with me, and then I'll read the next verse, and, and then you read the next verse after that with me. Luke chapter 19, we're going to start in verse number 1, we're going to read down through verse number 10. And so Luke 19 and verse number 1, the Bible says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Verse 2, ready? And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. Verse 4. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. Verse 6. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. And let's finish on verse number 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You may be seated tonight. And I want to talk to you just a few moments about that subject, why Zacchaeus could not see the Lord. Why Zacchaeus could not see the Lord. Again, this is simple, simple, simple tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll give you a few thoughts. We're going to let, let you go tonight. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be back in the house of the Lord tonight. And Lord, thank you for the great music and the choir and the specials. And uh, Lord, everything that's been done tonight has been so good. Thank you for the fellowship. And God, we just appreciate so much your blessing. Thank you for your so great salvation. And Lord... I pray now that, Father, you'll take this simple lesson. It's really what it is, just a, uh, a simple Bible lesson. And, uh, Lord, probably not very dy dynamic tonight. I probably won't be very bombastic tonight. But, God, I pray that you'll take this simple idea. And, Heavenly Father, I pray that it will find a resting place in someone's life, as it did in mine. Lord, as you revealed this to me the other day, I never really thought about it like this. And so, Lord, I pray that it will, uh, I pray it'll make a difference, not just today, but I pray it'll make a difference in the future, Lord, of all those that are here and those that are watching by way of the live stream tonight. I pray that Christ will receive glory and praise from it all. We ask you for your help, Lord, your power. Thank you for being so wonderful to us. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake, amen. We used to sing that little song, and I know you did. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Y'all remember that? You remember it? You could sing it, couldn't you? And I was singing it over in the study before I came over tonight. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And the song says he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, and we always did the motion, you know. You come down for the Lord you're going to see, for the Lord you're going to see. I want to point out tonight, if I could, several things about this uh, Bible character, Zacchaeus. And, uh, and when I get done tonight, you'll say, Pastor, all you did tonight was just state the obvious. And you're exactly right. I'm just stating the obvious tonight. I'm not teaching you anything that you don't know. Uh, as the Apostle Peter said, I'm just reminding the church of some things that you already know tonight. But I want to show you some things again. These are just 
uh, so obvious tonight, but some things that I want you to notice tonight. For instance, first of all, we see that Zacchaeus was a man. Now, uh, again, so simple tonight, but I want you to look at, uh, look at verse number two, Luke 19, verse number two, uh, because the Bible also points out the obvious. The Bible says in verse two, and behold, there was a what? There was a man. There was a man named Zacchaeus. Now, I read that the other day, and, and let me tell you how the Lord spoke to my heart. You know what that means? That means that this is not a parable. The Bible is using a personal name here. And so when I read that the other day, I thought, you know what this is? This is real life. This is the, the word of God that is addressing real issues, real people. And aren't you glad tonight, Calvary, that the word of God is so relevant and pertinent to our everyday personal life? You know, God is not just a God or Jesus is not just a Savior, but he's a personal Savior. And this book that you have in your, your hand tonight or your lap tonight, and this one that I have on my pulpit tonight, is not just a book, but this is a book that addresses our personal needs and our personal problems. And I wrote this down in big, bold letters in my outline, and I highlighted it in red, that the Word of God is not just an historical artifact. And that's where a lot of people are trying to approach the, the Bible from. And, and, I, and I'm all for it. I, I, I think it's great. I, I'm, I'm 100% for it. They're trying to sort of, you know, get these Bible classes in the public schools. And, and I'm all for that. I, I think it's wonderful. And I'm 100% I'm, I'm supportive. But one of the things that they're doing, though, is they're, they're trying to present the Bible as historical. That's maybe one of the reasons they're able to get it in there. Because we're just, you know, we're not presenting it as the Bible. We're just presenting it as historical. Uh, and I want to say, Calvary, it is historical, but it's much more than that. The Word of God is relevant to our everyday challenges. John Newton said it like this. Read the Scripture not as an attorney may read a will, merely to know the sense, but as the heir reads it as a description and proof of his interest. Uh, Dr. F.B. Meyer said it like this, read the Bible, not as a new newspaper, but as a letter from home. And that's so true. You know what the word of God is? This is God's love letter to you. Amen. It's God's love letter to you. And I remember those days, man, when Miss Tammy used to write me those love letters and I would go to, uh, I would go to math class and I know I shouldn't have done it, but you pray for me. And I would take those love letters and I would put those love letters in my math book and I would hold my math book up during math class, but I wasn't looking at algebra. And I, maybe that's why I had to take it twice. You know, and I, I wasn't uh, looking, you know, at trigonometry and geometry, but I was reading those love letters from Miss Tammy. And boy, she was telling me, you know, how handsome she thought I was and how much she loved me and how she wanted to be with me. And man, what a, what a blessing that was. And I, I want to tell you something. That's what this book right here is. This is not just a book. This is not just a history book. This is God's personal love letter to his children to tell you how much he loves you. And by the way, if you have a problem, I can promise you this, that the answer to your problem is right here in this book we have tonight, the word of God. And so we see that Zacchaeus was a man. How about this? Number two, we notice that Zacchaeus was chief among the publicans. Look back at verse number two again. The Bible says, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, notice, which was chief among the publicans. Now that also tells us something. And let me tell you what it tells us. It tells us that more than likely, Zacchaeus was probably the most hated man in his community. They hated him. The Jewish people hated Zacchaeus. In fact, they probably hated him with a vehement hatred. You see, Zacchaeus was seen as a traitor. He was a Jewish man that was working for the enemy, namely the Roman government. 
Rome at that time was the occupying force. It was the, it was the world power, if you will. And here they were occupying Israel. And, and what, Rome, you know, what, what, what Rome said went. And what they handed down was edict pretty much. And, and we notice here that in this day and time that Rome was demanding excessively high taxes from the people. Uh, taxes that sometimes they couldn't really realistically pay. And it was Zacchaeus' job to collect the tax. But not only was it his job to collect the tax, but it was his job to turn those in who failed to pay. And so you understand that people hated this man. They couldn't stand him. They wouldn't spit on him if he was on fire. I mean, he was was not only a publican, but he was the chief of the publicans. And so we, we, we notice here that Zacchaeus was a man. We notice that Zacchaeus was chief among the publicans, but I notice something else here. Number three, I notice that Zacchaeus was rich. He was rich. Look at verse two again. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. That tells us something as well. You say, Pastor, what does that teach us? Well, it teaches us that Zacchaeus had worked his way up through the system. He was not only a publican, he was the top dog. He was the head hog at the trough. He was the chief among the publicans, which means something else, church. It means that he had become trusted by the Roman government. They knew that they could, and and the Jewish people hated Rome. They hated the Roman government. And yet here Zacchaeus Zacchaeus is working for them, and he's become a trusted, uh, you know, a trusted uh, official with the Roman government. And often I understand this, that Rome would allow these publicans to, to take a little more than the tax that was required so they could pad their own pocket. And so they would come to the Jewish people, and they would collect the tax that Rome expected, but also they would hike it up just a little bit, and, uh, and the money that they received over and above that what Rome, uh, Rome demanded, well, they took that and they put that in their own pocket, and, uh, and Zacchaeus had done that to such an extent where the Bible tells us that this man was not just chief of the publicans, but this man was rich. He was rich. But I noticed something else. I noticed that Zacchaeus was little of stature. Look at, look at verse number three, the very last phrase. In verse number three, the Bible says, because he was little of stature. I looked up that word little, and it's the Greek word mikros, M-I-K-R-O-S. We get a word from that word. It's the word micro, micro. We might say it like this, microorganisms, or microcomputer, or microcosm, which means little world. And so we find here that the Bible says about Zacchaeus that he was micro, he was micros. He was, a, he was a little guy. And I don't know exactly what was going on. I don't know if, if there was a, a physical affliction. I don't know if there was a deformity of some kind. I, I'm not sure maybe Zacchaeus was maybe some kind of a dwarf or maybe there was a deformity. of some, I'm not sure exactly what, what, what it was. But I, I said all of that to say this. We notice here that he was a man. We notice that he was chief among the publicans. We notice that he was rich. We notice that he was little of stature. But what I want you to notice tonight is this, that none of these things that we just mentioned were the things that were hindering Zacchaeus from seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that he was a publican was not the thing that restricted him from seeing Jesus. In fact, you might remember another man. His name was Matthew. Matthew was also a publican. And Matthew was saved and eventually became a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't Zacchaeus' riches that kept him from seeing Jesus. Jesus had several rich people that followed him and were loyal to him and loved him. I don't believe that it was Zacchaeus' physical limitations that kept him from seeing Jesus, and I never really noticed it like this before. Church, the thing that kept Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus was the press. The press. You know what that word press means? It means a casual collection of people. Or it means this, the common people. It was people that hindered Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus. Now, again, 
we're not going to keep you, but just a few more moments. You know what I, you know what really is disturbing is that I'm seeing more and more people, the, the longer I pastor, I'm seeing more and more people that have issues in their life. But it's not the issues that are keeping them from seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the people. It's a throng, which is what that word press means, a throng, a rabble, a certain class of people. You look it up in the Greek, that's what it means. And I want to say, Calvary, whatever you do, don't be robbed of seeing Jesus because you're looking at a person instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, listen, did your parents ever, ever teach you this? Did your parents ever say, don't stare? Maybe you went to the grocery store and you know, there was just something, maybe someone was, maybe, maybe they had a, a, a deformity of some kind or maybe there was something and, and as a kid you were staring and your mom said, quit staring, quit staring. Well, tonight this is your pastor encouraging the congregation, quit staring. Are y'all with me tonight? Quit staring. Quit staring at the preacher. Quit staring at the deacon. Quit staring at the choir member. Quit staring at the Sunday school teacher. Quit staring at the Christian who left you down. Quit staring at the preacher who left the ministry. Quit staring at the church member who cheated you or maligned you or criticized you. Hey, quit staring at that person because if you get your eyes on people, you know what will happen? You'll totally miss seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. A few years ago, we were out on visitation and uh, over here on 115 and I had knocked on a door and we had uh, witnessed to a man and invited him to come to church and he said something like this. He said, preacher, he said at one time, he said, I was, uh, I, I was attending church. He said, I had just come into a new church and, and he said, I joined a Sunday school class and, and he said the uh, Sunday school teacher had, had uh, promoted a, an activity at his home and he wanted all the class to come over to his home. And so uh, he was brand new to the church. And he said, I thought that'd be a good thing to do. And so he said, sure enough, he said, I, I showed up that night. And he said, now this was a party that the Sunday school teacher had put together uh, at his home, his personal home. And he said, preacher, as I went to that home that night, he said, there were people that were drinking alcohol. He said, pastor, there were people at that party that were smoking marijuana and, and he said, as I just, uh, I don't even think this man was saved, but he said, as I went to that party, knowing that this was a party that was put on by the Sunday school teacher, and I saw those things that were going on, he said, when I left that party, he said, I never went back to church after that, and I guess not. And he said, I was so turned off. And I thought, you know what, if this is a Sunday school teacher, and if this is a church that's putting on a party like this, then you know what, I'm doing okay in the world. Why do I need to go to church if the church is acting like the world? And so this man, basically, he said this, Pastor, I have never been back to church since. And by the way, I didn't fuss at him that night. I didn't rebuke him. He had pretty good grounds to stand on, to be quite honest with you. And, uh, but I would say this to that man, and I would say this to anybody else. Be careful that, it, that, that you never get your eyes on the press. Don't get your eyes on a class of people. Don't get your eyes on folks. Don't get your eyes on others because you're destined to be disappointed. The only one that will never let you down is by the name of Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And so, listen, don't get too caught up with a preacher or an individual or a character or a mentor. Now you respect them and love them and pray for them and, and lift them up. But this is what I'm saying. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're here tonight and someone has disappointed you or someone has hurt you, did you know the best thing that you'll ever do is just forgive them and forget it and move on with your life and don't hold a grudge and don't allow yourself to become bitter and don't get even. Amen, amen. Hey, don't get your eyes on a person. Just forgive them. Just go on and resituate your eyes back where they need to be and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yes. Now we're done tonight, but I, I, th I thought about several things. Had Zacchaeus never seen Jesus? I want to show you some things that never would have happened. Number one, he would have remained lost or forever lost. 
Look at Luke 19, verse number six. The Bible says, and he made haste and came down, and the Bible says, and received him joyfully. You know, studying this out, uh, some scholars would say this, when was it that, that Zacchaeus actually got saved? And some said this, that probably there's a very good possibility that Zacchaeus got saved midair. The Bible says he came down and received him joyfully. But if Zacchaeus would have missed putting his eyes on Jesus, he would have missed the Savior speaking directly to him. And I am so thankful for the day that I saw the Lord. But I would say this, the enemy tried to get my eyes on the press. The day that I got born again, you know what the devil came and said? The devil came and said this, what are people gonna think? What are people gonna say? Your daddy's chairman of the deacons, your mama's a Sunday school teacher. You've been in this church for a long, long time. And, 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 and if you uh, go and, and you get born again, I mean, what's the youth group gonna think? And what's your youth director gonna think? And what are people gonna think? And you can't do that. You can't, you can't eat your pride and go down there and get, you can't do that. You know what the devil will say? Get your eyes on a person. Get your eyes on people. And Calvary, that's the worst. That's the worst advice you're ever gonna receive. Don't get your eyes on Jesus, uh, on people. Don't worry about what others may think or others may say. You keep your eyes on the Son of the living God. But I'll tell you something else. Number two, he would have missed the fellowship of Christ. Look at Luke 19, verse five. Oh, this is great. The Bible says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. And said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. Look at this. For today I must abide at thy house. You know what that means? Jesus Christ himself went to fellowship with Zacchaeus. Had Zacchaeus never seen Christ, had Zacchaeus only seen the throne, if he would have only seen the rabble, if he would have kept his eyes on the people, Zacchaeus would have missed fellowship with Jesus Christ. And I wonder tonight how many are missing incredible fellowship with Jesus because they've allowed people to block their view of Christ. You say, preacher, but you don't know what they've done. I don't care what they've done. I'm just lovingly telling you tonight that if you go through this life missing Jesus, you've missed something great. You keep your eyes on people, keep your eyes on that person that, that, that hurt you or hurt your feelings or, or did something against you or didn't treat you right or didn't shake your hand or, or didn't treat you like you think you ought to be treated. I'm just saying this, man, get over that stuff and forget about that and get your eyes off the press and get your eyes on Jesus. Why? So Jesus can come home and abide with you and you can fellowship with him. And so we see that, G, that, that Zacchaeus would have remained forever lost. He would have missed the fellowship of Christ. But let me give you this, this last one here. How about this? He would have missed amazing friendships. Zacchaeus would have missed amazing friendships. Well, you, well, you say, preacher, what do you mean? I'm telling you, church, he had them. I guarantee you, after this event, Zacchaeus was a man that was well-beloved. Because look what your Bible says in Luke chapter 19 and verse number 8. The Bible says, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Boy, I'm telling you, church, business picked up after Zacchaeus met Jesus. The Bible says he took the half of his goods and gave them to the poor. Now, can you imagine, here's this guy that's been taking these taxes for all these years and he goes down here to the, uh, the, the poor house and he walks up to the guy and he says, here, I want to give you something, friend. And he gives him a gold coin or gives him two or three gold coins. He goes to the next poor gentleman, gives him a little something, and goes to a little widow that doesn't have two nickels to rub together. And man, he blesses her in a, uh, in a big way. And then he walks uh, over to someone's door knocks on the door and, and uh, uh, the guy comes to the door sort of abruptly as he sees Zacchaeus there and he says, what do you want? And Zacchaeus says, I met a man, his name is Jesus. And he said, I gave my life to Christ. He said, sometime back, get this now church, get this. Sometime back, I took $50 from you wrongly. 
Here's 200. Fourfold. Here's 200. He goes to the next house and he does the same thing. He goes to the next house and does the same thing. And I'll guarantee you this, there were some folks that were paying attention. And I'll also guarantee you this, that there were some folks that probably fell in love with Zacchaeus. And had Zacchaeus never seen the Lord, he would have missed some amazing friendships. Now, we're done. But I want to point one thing out. Did y'all notice what helped Zacchaeus in seeing Jesus? It was a tree. Would you look please at Luke chapter 19 and verse number four? And the Bible says, and the Bible says, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was to pass that way. Some have suggested that the sycamore tree uh, over in the Middle East here had very low-lying limbs, making it easy for anyone to climb, including Zacchaeus. Although he was little of stature, it had low-lying limbs, and it, and it made this tree very accessible to all. Aren't you glad there's a tree that's accessible to all? We used to sing a song that says this, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No man stands higher than I. I can call on Jesus' name and a king can do the same. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Oh, listen, Calvary, this is all I'm saying tonight. Get your eyes off the preacher. Get your eyes off the deacon. You get your eyes off the Sunday school teacher. That's not where they're supposed to be. You get your eyes off that, that Christian that fell or that servant that fell away. Get your eyes off them and get your eyes on a tree. And more than that, get your eyes on the Christ of the tree, the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Dr. Tom Williams used to say this, whenever your heart gets a little cold, run to John 19 and read of the crucifixion. Isaac Watts, they say, was preparing for a communion service when he wrote these words. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his hands, his head, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine? That were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine. Demands my soul, my life, my all. I told you it was simple. You know what I, you know who I feel sorry for? I feel sorry for those Christians who somewhere along the line, something happened. And they got their eyes focused on a person. They got their eyes focused on a failure. They got their eyes focused on a problem. Oh, listen, Calvary, tonight, get your eyes off those things and turn your eyes upon Jesus Christ. Would you do that tonight? That's a, that's, you'll, you'll never hear a simpler message than that. But I don't know that you'll ever hear a more important message than that. Just put your eyes on the Savior tonight. Would you bow your heads with me, Father? Thank you for this simple admonition tonight. God, here was a man who was chief of the publicans. He was rich. Here was a man that was little of stature. But God, those weren't necessarily the things that were blocking his view of Jesus. Lord, there were people in the way. There was a, there was a press that was blocking his view. And God, I'm so thankful that Zacchaeus found his way to a tree. And because of that tree, it made it able for him to see the Lord. God, I don't know who in the world I'm preaching to tonight. Preaching to me, I know that. But Lord, it's very, very possible that there's somebody here tonight and somewhere along the line, they didn't mean to let it happen, but somewhere along the line, somebody did something or said something, somebody mistreated them, 
And Lord, they got their eyes focused on that person, that issue, those hard feelings, that grudge, that problem, and they totally have missed the Lord. Father, tonight I pray that you'd maybe help somebody to come and realign their vision. And tonight, Heavenly Father, I pray that they turn their eyes on Jesus and only Him. Lord, may we see no man save Jesus only. Have your way in this invitation. Lord, I pray that you'll bless now as our personal workers are making their way to the front. I pray that you'll work in hearts. And our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed tonight. Let's all stand if you would please. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just a question. How many of you here tonight would say, preacher, if I died tonight, I know for sure that I would go to heaven. I know that I've been born again. I can honestly say that. You raise your hand right now. Preacher, I know that I'm saved. I, well, that don't never get old to us, by the way. How many of you have ever done a wave offering to the Lord? I try to do a wave offering every, every week, man. I just try to wave to the Lord and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, the Bible talks about lifting up holy hands. You know, every once in a while, you ought to just lift up some holy hands and say, thank you, Lord, for being so good. But I wonder if there might be someone else here tonight and you'd say, Pastor, I couldn't raise my hand. And if I died tonight, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. And you'd let me pray for you right now. You'd slip your hand up. Is there one anywhere? Can I pray for you? Is there anybody here tonight? Pastor, remember me. Remember me. I'm going to pray. Hey, if you've got your eyes on anybody other than Jesus tonight, it's time to change your vision. So, Father, I pray that you'd bless in this invitation. I'm thankful for those that have already responded. And maybe there's others, Lord, that ought to come. I pray that, Father, you'd work in hearts and, and help those folks to make decisions that need to be made. Maybe someone needs to rededicate their life. Maybe someone's been saved, but they've not followed in believers' baptism or it could be church membership. It could be a lot of things. But God, I pray that you'd help folks to come. Maybe there's somebody here tonight and it's just been a long, long time since they cast their eyes upon Jesus and said, Jesus, I love you so much. And God, tonight maybe somebody needs to just slip out to this old-fashioned altar and just come down here somewhere and just say, Lord, I just want you to know that I love you. And I want you to help me to keep my eyes on me. Father, have your way now, please. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Hey, if you need to come, now's a great, great opportunity. All right? Would you come? We've got some folks that would love to, to meet you here and pray with you and give you some scripture tonight. So right now, if God's dealing with your heart, just step out. Step out and come tonight. If you're watching by way of the live stream and you have a need in your life, maybe you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, there's a number on the bottom of your screen. I want you to call that number right now. I want you to call it. There's somebody waiting to talk to you on the phone. And we would love to pray with you. If you're watching the broadcast tonight and you've got a heavy, heavy burden, and you say, Pastor, I don't know how much longer I can bear this burden. I want you to call that number right now, okay? We want to pray with you over the phone. Would you come? That's right. Folks are coming. Amen. Folks are making decisions. Would you come while we wait? We'll sing in just a minute. Let's just keep our heads bowed just for, just for a moment or so.
Father, would you work in hearts right now? Lord, some folks are getting some help. Lord, you're so faithful to work. Thank you, Lord, for letting us experience your absolute wonderful presence. Thank you for the wonderful Holy Spirit. And God, I'm so thankful that you've been working, God, in such a remarkable way. Lord, folks are coming to Jesus. Folks are rededicating their lives. Folks are getting baptized. It's wonderful, Father. I'm just so glad I'm just, I'm able just to be here and watch it. I'm so privileged. And God, I thank you for what you're doing right now. God, do the supernatural now. Have your way. Would you just join me in prayer right now? Just Let's just be praying. We're going to sing in a minute, but while folks are getting some help, we're going to just keep things sort of calm. Hey, can we sing this chorus? This goes right along with the message tonight. Most of you know it. You could probably sing this without words on the screen tonight. But we're going to sing this through a time or two. And let this be your prayer tonight as we sing this chorus, all right? I would, I, would just, uh, I would just remind us of this. The question is not, are you going to be offended? The question is, when is it going to happen? It's going to happen, church. But when it happens, keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. Forgive, forget, go forward. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And... Uh, you say, well, preacher, I don't have my eyes on anybody except me. Oh, man. You're in bad shape now. You're in bad shape. <laughs> Can I tell this little story real quick? Uh, Jay Vernon McGee, I love Dr. McGee. I, I encourage folks to get his commentaries and things. Dr. McGee said he went to, a, uh, he went to a, a, one of these conferences, like a self-help motivational type conference. And this is what they, one of the things they were teaching was this. They said, now, when you go home, every single day when you go home, first thing, when you get up out of the bed, go to the mirror. And he said, you're to look in the mirror and you're to say this, I love you. 
You're to look at yourself and say, I love you. I love you. I love you. So Dr. Mead left that conference. And he went home that very first day. He got up and he got in front of the mirror and, and he looked in the mirror and he said, I I, and he said, I don't love you. He said, you give me trouble every single day. I have to fight you every day, tooth and nail. And that's true, isn't it? Isn't that true? And so don't, whatever you do, don't get your eyes, don't get your eyes on self. Amen. Well, hey, listen, I'm going to ask some, come on up, Brianna and Thomas. Y'all come on up here if you will. And, uh. We have been, uh, we've been talking to Thomas and uh, Brianna here la the last little bit, and uh, I'm super proud of these kids. They, they are, uh, they're growing in the Lord, and they have made, and this is all I'll say, they have made some very serious decisions so they could do what they're getting ready to do, and that's join the membership of this church. Both of them have been saved. Uh, this is Thomas Cass. This is Brianna Wallace, of course. And uh, both have been saved. And we baptized Thomas just the other night, by the way. And they're coming tonight to join uh, the membership of the Calvary Baptist Church. And so uh, I could not be more excited. And I know God's got big, big plans for them. And so you pray for them, if you will. And we've already talked to them about new members' classes and all that. And we've met with them and counseled with them. And, uh, and it's been a blessing. And so do I hear a motion tonight that we receive them as a, a member of the Calvary Baptist Church? Brother Rod, you going to make that motion? All right. Uh, Brother Stacy, I saw your hand. I'll let somebody different do it tonight. Brother Stacy, you going to make that second? All in favor, say amen. amen. All right. I'm not going to ask uh, Thomas and Brianna to, to stay up in front of the church tonight, but after the service, I do want you to find them and shake their hands and welcome them in and love on them tonight. And then you pray, you pray for them that God will help them and that they'll grow in the Lord. And, and I'm going to be the first. All right. Amen. I know God's got big, gigantic plans for y'all. And so just let God use you. He wants to use you greatly. Amen. Amen. It's been a great day today. And we're so glad you've been here. Listen, hope you have a wonderful week. Hope you get some rest. We'll look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. Uh, and so don't forget the uh, prayer Bible study. Uh, Wednesday night, and so, uh, Brother Tim, come on over if you will. I'm going to let you dismiss us in, in prayer. If you and Brother Luna quit cutting up over there, all right? And uh, He started it. That's all I'm going to say. He started it. Let's pray, church. We love you, Lord, and we're thankful for the miracles, Lord, that we are beholding and that we behold on a regular basis in this place. There's nothing special about this building other than the fact that it was erected for your presence and your people God, we enjoyed this place today because you were here. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the Spirit of God that meets with us, Lord, regularly. And Lord, it's our prayer, it's our humble prayer that, God, you would come and continue to empower us as your people in this city. Thank you, God, for all that you have done today. Thank you for, Lord, the things that you've done in our past. And Lord, we Unite together as your people, believing that you have great things in our future as well. Use us each individually, Lord, as we return to our homes and our jobs. And Lord, our circle of influence, may we preach and explain and expose Jesus. Send light into the darkness. May we carry, Lord, the hope of salvation with us everywhere we go. Protect us all, Lord, from sin. Keep us holy in our lives. We love you. And in Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Hey, Calvary, I heard that Mason's Ice Cream Shop is now staying open until 9 o'clock. All right. God bless y'all. Have a good night. Thank you for joining us today. We consider it an honor to serve you. And our prayer is that the service was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. If you were impacted today by the preaching of God's word, we encourage you to respond. If we can pray with you, or if you would like to make a decision today for Christ, please call us here at 704-327-5662. We have people waiting right now on the lines prepared to help you. Again, thank you for joining us today. And we hope to welcome you again soon. Have a wonderful week.